Okay, so in this video clip, we're going to take a look at how to build uh, the zero coupon yield curve. And the standard technique that's commonly used is to bootstrap uh, sequential bond uh, maturities. So we would take a number of bonds uh, that have maturities of uh, uniform intervals, and then we would build up sequentially applying a bootstrap technique uh, now I've done that before and I'll leave a video clip explaining a little bit the rationale. Uh, but specifically what we want to do here is to apply the Linus function to try and automate a little bit uh, some of the arduous uh, work associated with the yield curve. Uh, just for purely definition, what is the yield curve? Uh, the yield curve I'm using Wikipedia here, a yield curve uh, showing several yield to maturity or interest rates across different contract lengths, two months, uh, two years, 20 years. Now we will do six months, 12 months, 18 months and 24 months, um, but the it can be generalized. The approach, uh, the bootstrap approach can be generalized for the much longer maturities. The curve shows the relationship between the interest the level of the interest rate or the cost of borrowing and the time to, to maturity known as the term of the debt for a given borrower in a given currency. And the US dollar interest rate paid on US treasury securities for, vary, for varying maturities are closely watched by many traders and are commonly plotted on a graph such as the one on the right. So typically we're looking at, let's say the yield curve, this is for uh, 2018 05 and we get um, the cost of borrowing for uh, the uh, treasury bill and uh, treasury note and bonds, right? So yield, treasury bill is up to one year, treasury note up to five years and treasury bonds uh, beyond five years, longest maturity in bonds typically 30 years in the US. Okay, now uh, we could go directly to the US uh, Department of Treasury and construct, um, pull off uh, that information as well. Um, and to give a kind of more general um, perspective here, I'm gonna go on to investing.com. Uh, let's go to markets, come down to bonds, look at world government bonds. And we're currently in, uh, uh, March uh, 2021 and currently if we take the United States for instance again maybe as our starting point and look at uh, the yields on instruments so zero coupon yields on instruments uh, going from uh, today up to 30 years you can see the behavior of the interest rate now we have uh, basically, looking at this, uh, our yield curve is positive. Um, that's what we would normally expect. We'll see some exceptions in a moment. But we're looking at the yield for one month, three months, six months, one year, all the way out to 30 years, right? And the state of play has changed a little bit in recent times. So currently, it's this uh, darker uh, navy color but one month ago, it was the interest rates were lower and one year ago, lower again. And that might have been a result of asset purchases by the Federal Reserve. And the interest rates bumping up here may reflect some of the effects uh, anticipated in the market of maybe rising interest rates in the future. There has been a stimulus package, um, I think 1.9 trillion or so. So that might have the effect of uh, pushing up interest rates. Um, if we go to Europe, uh, for instance, uh, the shape of the yield curve would look a little bit different. Um, if we go to Germany, we're going to find typically that interest rates uh, are negative. That is very unusual. This is something that's really uh, exceptional. Um, and uh, it does bear thinking about a little bit the new sort of macroeconomic uh, world that we live in. Now, interest rates can never be extremely negative, but they can be negative. Uh, and that means when you lend the government money, uh, take, they will charge you interest, which is counterintuitive. 
but because people are locked into certain types of regulation, they have to invest a proportion of their investable funds in government bonds because these are typically considered to be safe and you're taking a hit, right? So pension funds, insurance companies that have uh, their investable funds tied up in government bonds, basically you're taking a hit right up to 20 years. Okay, now it's barely negative, but it's still negative. And then a slightly positive um, after 30 years. So uh, these rates of interest are very insightful. We tend to look at them when we're trying to understand what's happening in the economy. And the zero coupon yield curve is a benchmark set of interest rates that we typically would consider prior to make any kind of major investment decision. Uh, if we look at um, other countries then, maybe in the Eurozone, if we look at France, for instance, we're going to find negative rates as well. And again, this is exceptional, right? This is historic. This is a kind of aberration from uh, historic norms. And again, it's, it's the result of the ECB engaging in asset purchase, buying up government bonds, um, bidding up the price to the point where interest rates are actually negative on those instruments. Okay, so that's kind of background, but we want to do something very specific here. We want to look at how we would just estimate for each maturity the zero coupon yield um, uh, that we normally observe in, in the yield curve or term structure and uh, the process involved here typically involves stripping off uh, the coupon. Now, um, we have four bonds in this instance. So the data that we are initially handed is the, the bond price, so the cash price of the bond, and then the maturity, and then the principal or the face redeemed at maturity, right? And the first two instruments are treasury bills. They don't have... Uh, they're not coupon bearing, so it's a relatively straightforward estimation. If we invest 94 today, get 100 back after six months. The only unknown here where we're looking for the continuous rate of return is R. We can solve for R uh, by taking the natural logarithm of both sides. So we divide both sides initially by 94, then take the natural logarithm, E falls out. And then we solve for R, we get 12%. And for the second uh, bond uh, here, we have 89 being invested uh, today. After one year, we get $100 back. What's the continuously compounded rate of interest embedded in that arrangement? Well, we can solve because there's only one unknown. Right? So when we go in here, we can see, look, uh, R is unknown. Uh, divide both sides by 89 take the natural logarithm both sides and we get 11.6534. For the third instrument then, it's more complicated because now we've defected the coupons. The only way we can deal with that is to strip off. So we have 94.84, uh, we invest for a period of 18 months, we'll get $100 back face, it's redeemed as face in 18 months time. But for month six, month 12, month 18, we're getting a coupon payment of four. So we're going to strip out the intermediate coupons. The way we would typically do that is we set up the, the information based on the, the bond and the present value, the 9484 represents the present value of the bond. We discount at the these rates that so we're bootstrapping, basically taking the previous rates we had worked out and bootstrap in or recycle back in these interest rates commensurate with the time period. So the six month and the 12 month are, uh, time frames are incorporated in and we discount at the appropriate rate. We get a discounted coupon of 732. We subtract away, we get 8752. Uh, then we've just one unknown, we solve for R divide both sides by 104, take natural logarithm both sides, E drops out, and then we get 11.5. Again, this example is coming from uh, uh, John C. Hall, uh, Option Futures and Other Derivatives. And it's um, 
it's a standard example that he uses. I've just worked it through a little bit more and beefed out a little bit of the estimation. So that's a good textbook to go and consider this area. John C. Hall, Option Futures, Other Derivatives. Uh, it's uh, chapter four. OK, so I'll just get a reference here for that textbook, uh, Option Futures and Other Derivatives, uh, John C. Hall. I think there's a 10th edition. There's, there's um, more current editions. But if we go in here, it is roughly chapter, I think it's chapter four, right, on the interest rates, right? So bond pricing, determining the treasury zero rates. So this section here is the one that you would look at. OK, and I'm following that fairly closely here. OK, so let's go back in then to uh, our spreadsheet. Uh, this is a textbook example I'm following along. Now, what I do here that's a little bit different, I've just tried to beef up a little bit the each step of the estimation. You can see it's quite arduous. If we take the third bond or the fourth bond instrument here, 9712 invested uh, for two years, get a semi-coupon. So that every six months we have five, 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 and five. And then uh, in terms of trying to work out what the two year zero coupon rate is, that's a little bit arduous because we have to get discount five at what rate the bootstrapped six month rate. We have to discount five again at the bootstrapped one year rate. We discount five uh, at the 18 month, uh, zero coupon rate, uh, sorry, at the, uh, yeah, at the zero coupon rate. Um, and so we're recycling or bootstrapping back in each of the interest rates we had calculated previously and the sequence then we respect. Once those uh, values then can be discounted at the these known rates of interest, these zero coupon rates, uh, then we can strip off, we can take the discounted coupons, uh, take the sum product uh, of the cash flows, uh, evaluate the present value of the coupons, subtract them out. So that's the stripping off effect. Then we're left with just one unknown. And we can solve for R, divide both sides by 105, take the natural logarithm both sides, work out what R is. Now that involves a few steps and one can imagine doing this uh, for a 30 year term. So is there a way we can actually set this up to deal with the, uh, can we automate a little bit this process here and expi expedite the estimation? Turns out we can. And the way we could do that is uh, use the Linus function. So let's just summarize the information that we have. We have time period zero. We have month five, sorry, month six, month 12, month 18. So that's 1.5 years. And we have then at the end, the two year bond, right? And if we take the first bond, it means you're paying 94, but then at the end of that 94, so you put up 94 today and then you're 94. Let's run that. So it's 94 following along with what we have here. But what do you get back? You get uh, four. No, you get uh, at the end of the six months, you get 100. OK, so that's fine. And then we have zero, zero, zero. And then the second bond instrument represents an investment today of 89. So you pay out 89, but then you're in receipt of, well, no coupon the first period. It is a zero coupon instrument, but 80, uh, 100 uh, in month 12, and then nothing else beyond that date. And then for the third bond instrument, we have negative 98, uh, sorry, 94, 94, 84, 94.84. And we get in this instance, a coupon of four at month six, a coupon of four at month uh, 12, 104 at month 18, but nothing beyond that date. And then the final instrument, uh, you pay 97, 97.12, 97 dollars 12 cent. 
you get a coupon of five, month six, five, month 12, five, month 18, and then 105 at the end of the, the term, right? Okay, now we can do an estimation here using Linest. So we make, make use of the Linest function, right? So let's demonstrate that. Uh, and we can write it like this, equal to Linest, Linest, open bracket, negative, and we're going to predict these y's. This is our dependent variables. And then our x independent variables are the cash flows. And then we don't take a constant. So we reject the constant. And we don't, of course, need any further statistics. right? So it's false and false for those two. And then hit return, and the, we do get array output. Right now, how do we interpret uh, what we have here? Well, very simply, if we take um, the, we basically say uh, equal to. So to recover the interest rates we had obtained then in our estimation, the twelve percent, the eleven, uh, the eleven point five, it is linest open bracket uh, negative zero point zero seven nine uh, and then we divide that by the time period in question and note that the order of the variables uh, gets reversed here so it is uh, we divide by uh, two years right so two okay and we get just putting that together 11 uh, 0.299. Now let's go and explain that just briefly, right? So this 11299 corresponds with the 11299 that I had obtained here. Now the order of the variable switches around. So uh, that's one of the features of Linest. So even though we're moving this direction in the cash flows, the order then of the estimation gets turned around. Let's see if we can recover again. Uh, the 11.5 that we had estimated here, following in tow with what we had done before, we say equal to, equal to negative, negative LN, uh, our friend above here, and then we divide that by the 1.5, because that's the term involved, and we get 11. 11.5 .5 consistent with the result we had here. What about the result before? Equal to negative the natural logarithm, open bracket 0 0.89, 0 0.89, close bracket divided by the time period in question one year. We should get 11.65. Three, four. Okay. And it's just uh, we have to put in our bracketing correctly. Okay, 11653, and then finally then equal to negative the natural logarithm, the open bracket 094, close brackets correctly, divided by the 05, the respective time period. And we get 12.375, 12.375, which is consistent with what we have here. So basically what we've managed to do here, if we can reconstruct the data in our table, map out the cash flows according to the relevant maturity, right? That's important. Then the stripping of the coupons that we had to manually do and perform in the bootstrapping technique that can be simplified by using Linest. Now we can do better than this in terms of applying Linest, but at least uh, you can see here in terms of our application, uh, this certainly streamlines the estimation and it obviates the need to engage in this much uh, uh, convoluted type of estimation where we have to take each value sequentially and then bootstrap back in this fast tracks that approach. Um, okay, I'm going to leave that there.